why hello there i recently conducted an interview with blasphemous one and two's creative director the high dramatist himself enrique cabeza we discussed what media has influenced him creating the world and story of blasphemous 2 and maybe even a little bit about the blasphemous 2 dlc I am a huge fan of the Blasphemous series, and it was such a joy to speak with Enrique and ask him about his creative process in making these games that I love. But this interview was only possible because of your support of my Blasphemous content. So please be sure to subscribe to the channel for more Blasphemous content, like the video if you enjoyed the interview, and leave a comment with your thoughts. Let's get into it. First, I asked him what artists have been foundational in forming his own approach to telling stories and creating worlds in video games. He responded, My tastes in cinema, literature, and video games are wide and varied, but the creators that inspire me the most and have been key to my way of working are those who trigger my imagination to the point of trapping me and making me return to them over and over again, almost obsessively. Cabeza cited directors like Stanley Kubrick, with The Shining, Eyes Wide Shut in 2001 A Space Odyssey, as well as David Lynch with Lost Highway in Mulholland Drive. He also highlighted the works of painters Francis Bacon and Francisco de Goya, whose works have served as inspiration in both of the blasphemous games, especially de Goya whose moody depictions of Inquisition-era Spain had a direct impact on the atmosphere of Custodia. Cabeza concludes his answer by saying, As for video games, I cannot fail to mention Hidetaka Miyazaki, Shigeru Miyamoto, and Hideo Kojima. And indeed, these three legendary directors factored into the creation of Blasphemous 2's narrative, as we will find out in Cabeza's answer to the following question. Next, I asked Enrique if there is any specific media that influenced his approach to Blasphemous 2's narrative and creating the world. He said, the initial inspiration for the main arc of Blasphemous 2 came from The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask. While Blasphemous 1 time seems to stand still, trapped in an eternal sunset, in Blasphemous 2 I wanted to create an atmosphere of tension before an imminent and fatal event for the inhabitants of Custodia. Therefore, the game's story takes place in the moments leading up to the birth of a religious icon, the new son of the miracle. Unlike Majora's Mask, where time is a central game mechanic, in Blasphemous 2, the anticipation of the birth of the Miracle Sun is a purely narrative and atmospheric device. Cabeza continues, On the other hand, the idea of introducing the game's bosses, the arch confraternity of penitents led by Eviterno, is inspired by Metal Gear Solid 1. In that game, the bosses are introduced early on, which generates in players a growing expectation to face them. In addition, this contributes to a sense of narrative progression similar to the chapters of a novel. And I'll add that this is a narrative structure also employed by the previously mentioned Hidetaka Miyazaki, who likes to do sort of a roll call at the beginning of the Souls games to introduce the big bads for a similar effect. For the miracle was about to give birth to a child. Now you may have noticed this cool shirt and you may have asked yourself, is this a Blasphemous shirt? Maybe Elden Ring? It's not, but I got it because it does remind me of some of my favorite games ever. I got this shirt from Into the AM who are sponsoring today's video. Into the AM is an apparel company and what drew me to them is their graphic tees. They have a ton of striking designs, including these three, which they were kind enough to send to me. I got this astronaut design for the Eclipse and because it reminded me of Returnal, which is a banger of a game, and I got this design to wear to the beach. One thing I don't like about graphic tees sometimes is how the designs can fade and crack, so before promoting them I wanted to make sure that not only are the designs cool, but also the quality is there. I've been wearing these shirts consistently throughout the summer, and I'm happy to say that the graphics have held up perfectly and the tees are very comfortable. So check out Into the AM at the referral link in the description below, and be sure to enter the coupon code THELORHUNTER to get a discount. Now let's get back to the interview. Team17, publisher of Blasphemous 1 and 2, put up a series of dev diaries on their YouTube channel for Blasphemous 2, and if you haven't seen them, they're very good. In this series, Mr. Cabeza described the feeling of developing Blasphemous 1 as a completely uncharted road in a void. So I asked Enrique how he described the feeling of developing Blasphemous 2. He responded, It can be difficult to explain, and probably each team member experienced it differently. On the one hand, we had learned a lot about combat design, gameplay, game feel, and technical troubleshooting. Blasphemous 2 gave us the opportunity to apply all that knowledge. 
However, we had to create a new engine from scratch, as the Blasphemous 1 engine was too limited for our ambitions. And for the record, the creation of this new engine for Blasphemous 2 was no small undertaking. The Game Kitchen CEO Mauricio Garcia told Edge Magazine back in July 2023 that they spent 18 months rebuilding their tools to develop Blasphemous 2. Enrique continues, Besides the technical aspect, the predominant feeling, at least for me, was the fear and the challenge to create a more complete game with more features and greater opportunities for design, gameplay, and game feel. This time we no longer had on our side the surprise and shock factor that Blasphemous 1 had, and we feared that Blasphemous 2 would not have the same basic impact. We knew that the fans had high expectations, and throughout the development we were afraid of disappointing them. Fear in the face of such a challenge can bring out the best in you, but it also creates insecurity, which can affect our judgment. That insecurity made us doubt our instincts more than when we developed the first game. Cabeza speaks more on the fear of the sophomore slump in the previously mentioned series of dev diaries about Blasphemous 2. He then concludes his answer with some wisdom he has gained from his experiences in the design process. I usually say that developments have a life of their own, that is, it is impossible to have everything under control, what you expect to go one way can go another way, and in the end, each development there are too many variables, constant unforeseen problems, so in the end, even if you have more experience, you come back to something very similar to the uncharted territory you mention in the question. Continuing the topic of developing a sequel, I asked him if his approach to developing the world and story changed between Blasphemous 1 and 2. Enrique answered with, I don't think so. I think it has been similar, although in Blasphemous 1, I also had a role dedicated to using the engine to decorate levels, create sprites, correct animations, in addition to having to learn a lot of pixel art for the Kickstarter campaign. In Blasphemous 2, I have a higher level role, where I've delegated the technical aspects, I'm able to dedicate myself to directing and having more time for the creative and narrative parts of the game. Spanish art and history are integral to the story of Blasphemous, and I've spent a lot of time on it in a video specifically about the topic, as well as my Blasphemous 1 analysis. For this next question, I asked Cabeza if he selected specific cultural elements and then made the story and world around that, or if he created the story in a world and then chose elements that fit into the themes and concepts he had in mind. Enrique explained, I think it's a combination of all of that. Sometimes an idea comes naturally and I fall in love with it, which leads me to research cultural or historical aspects to see if they fit into the lore or art of the game. Other times I'm researching something specific or looking for inspiration and suddenly something clicks, revealing an interesting idea that I can work on. My main working tool is my instinct and my emotions. If something seems to fit in theory but doesn't provoke a special emotion in me, I prefer to discard that path or element. If an idea doesn't move me deeply, I know that no matter how hard I try, it will never work. I asked Cabeza if he could elaborate on any themes or concepts that he used to guide the art and story when creating Blasphemous 2. He told me that he would try. For example, the concept of time in art. Music and cinema depend directly on time to exist and function. While a painting or a sculpture do not, they are static art forms, pieces trapped in an instant, unchanging. It is in their stillness that they transmit emotions to us. It's as if their condemnation to immobility is the source of their beauty. Many inhabitants of Custodia are similarly trapped, as if they are part of a sculpture or an enclosed in a painting, alive but static after all. Although they can evolve as we progress through their quest, they eventually become static again. It's difficult to explain. We see evidence of this theme throughout the characters in the game. Characters like Castillo and Trifon, as well as Our Lady of the Chalices, present almost like tableaus to us, and we witness them in these static changes in their transformation, with the actual transformation happening off screen, and ultimately a final scene that will remain static as their storyline concludes. This is of course how games work, with changes happening and with loading screens and there being an end to quest lines, but I think it's a nice way of using the artifice in the theme. And I like how we're able to experience these static scenes where the characters may not really move, but through our progression and movement through the game, these stories happen. And of course, with characters like Montañez and Regula, there is a more direct connection to this idea of sculpture and art, 
with Montanius being a blind sculptor who's trying to capture his last moment of sight in his final and grand sculpture, or with Regula who has the face of the Lady of the Temple she is protecting and she's holding it up, stuck in this moment where if she lets go, it will all crumble. Enrique continues, Something similar happens with the endings of Blasphemous 2. Two endings of the base game culminate in a static final image. In one, the penitent becomes a religious symbol in the sky along with incarnate devotion, the emblem of the second psalm. This symbol cannot be formed without both characters being trapped forever, creating an immutable image. At the other ending, both the penitent and other characters form another kind of painting, the canvas of light and time, which refers to the religious paintings of past centuries, where gods, saints, angels, cherubs, etc., were depicted in a large composition full of characters. An expert in art might express these ideas better than me, but in short, I have tried to transfer to a video game the immutable character of paintings and sculptures, and how, in their immutability, they convey their beauty no matter how grotesque their appearance. Now, this is not the video to be spouting my own thoughts, but I do think it's interesting how between Blasphemous 1 and 2, Cabeza has explored this idea of eternity through immutability and being frozen in time in various ways. But I'll leave you to ponder that one on your own time for now. Let's move on to the next question. After getting all hot and thematic, I had to lighten things up a bit. Blasphemous style. The miracle manifests the thoughts and dreams of custodians and often twists these desires or wants in an ironic way. I asked Enrique how he thought that the miracle would twist and corrupt him, and I'd encourage you to give me your own answers in the comments. Capeza answered, My character could be at the bottom of a very deep and dirty well, trying to climb up exhausted and trembling, clinging to wet and worn bricks while being guided by a faint light filtering from the surface, but again and again I end up falling down and starting again. 1010, no notes on that answer. One of my favorite aspects of the Blasphemous games are the creative enemy designs. They often have a visual concept that ties into Spanish culture, a gameplay concept, and they serve a role in world building. While all these aspects play into the iterative process of creating an enemy, I asked Cabeza where an enemy design usually started. He explained that everything usually starts with an idea that seduces me in some way, that makes me think and imagine, and that keeps going around in my mind until it becomes a kind of obsession, like something trapped that needs to be released. That idea can come up at any time while walking down the street, watching a movie, reading a book, or even while I'm about to fall asleep. For this to happen, I need to be creatively open, which is not always the case. The idea can be very abstract, but it doesn't matter how vague it is as long as I manage to capture it in a quick sketch in my notebook. That sketch is the key to everything. It must have something special that excites me because only then do I move on to the next phase, drawing it again, but with more details, trying different proportions, colors, and exploring how it could work in the game both mechanically and artistically. Then I talk with our concept artist to work together and shape it until it becomes a final concept. And he adds, I hope you can get a copy of the physical edition of the Blasphemous 2 art book where I explain many things for every element of the game. And I will echo that recommendation, the Blasphemous 1 and 2 art books are among my favorite possessions and give incredible insight into the creative process in creating these games. For the next question, I pull out Old Reliable. I asked Enrique if he has a favorite enemy or boss design in Blasphemous 2. He said, I think the boss, Orspina, is one of my favorites. Also, Aphilidor, its concept comes from something very iconic from my country. There's also another one that I cannot talk about yet, if you know what I mean. And I can't help but wonder if that last cheeky little statement by Enrique relates to this recent Twitter post that Enrique made, in which he is playing Blasphemous 2 on Steam Deck in an area that I don't quite recognize, and he seems to be holding mea culpa. And folks, this is not the only little Blasphemous 2 DLC tease that we will get in this interview. And as for the bosses mentioned, you can learn more about both of them in the Blasphemous 2 art book. Orespina is based off of all these cool historical Spanish ladies, and the Affiliador is one of the most interesting professions that I had not heard of until Blasphemous 2, and I really like that boss, and it's a really cool concept for one. It's worth checking out the history behind them. And last, but certainly not least, I asked Cabeza if, for Blasphemous 1, that they created the story of the DLC 
before the base game was released or this was something they developed after the release of the base game. And also if they are taking a similar approach with Blasphemous 2. Enrique responded, The story of the DLCs is never planned before the release of the base game, it always takes place after. However, sometimes there are content, characters, features, and other elements that could not be included in the base game due to time or budget constraints and we know we will want to include them in DLC if possible. It is the same approach for both games. And there you have it, as close as I'm willing to get about asking about Blasphemous 2 DLC, knowing you can't say anything until it's time, but from this we can gather that the Blasphemous 2 DLC story content is something that was developed after Blasphemous 2 released about a year ago now, and also that it may include some cut content that they couldn't fit in the base game, and I wonder if one of those things, perhaps the mea culpa, is the mysterious fourth weapon that they couldn't fit into the base game. And there you have it, all about Enrique Cabeza's creative process in developing Blasphemous 2. Huge thanks to Mr. Cabeza for taking the time to answer these questions. I really liked his thoughtful and insightful answers. If you'd like to read this interview, you can find a link in the description below to the written interview. Also, once again, I'd like to thank Into the AM for sponsoring this video. You can click the referral link in the description below to check out their cool graphic tees. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more interviews, please subscribe to The Lore Hunter, like the video, and leave a comment with your thoughts. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, it is through your support on my content that I'm able to do cool things, like talk to the creative director of one of my favorite games ever. Thanks for watching.